join me in welcoming Patrick Reynolds. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it's an honor and a, a privilege to be here. And um, I just really, I guess, first thing I want to say is I want to thank and applaud uh, the vision of Lakeland Healthcare to bring me here and to focus the community's attention on smoking and on tobacco issues and to get me in front of five or six hundred middle school children tomorrow morning. I mean, wow, you know, you guys should come to that because there I'm like really styling. You know, it's, like, <laughs> it's like, that's where I shine. It's like there's fireworks when I talk to kids. You know, here we do have to go into some slides with percentages of this and the grades that Michigan gets in tobacco control. And, you know, but tomorrow morning, that won't be in my talk. It's just pictures and, uh, you know, they don't care about the health consequences. They do not care that they might die when they're 40. 40, that's old. <laughs> they care about looking cool. They do not want the tobacco industry marketing to be in their face. So I'm going to show you a bunch of the slides that I will be showing to the children tomorrow. And it, it's so exciting to me to get 500 middle school kids where I get to make a difference. And um, tonight we're going to explore a little bit about the uh, tobacco control report card for Michigan. We'll compare it to Indiana just for fun. You guys win. <laughs> And I think Indiana gets three F's and a D, and you get two F's and a B and a C. And we'll go into what those grades are for and all that. But uh, before I get into that, uh, I want to tell you a story or two about the Reynolds family. Because it would be like if, what, Paris Hilton or Kim Kardashian or mm -hmm. Ivanka Trump got up in front of a group and didn't say a word about her family. <laughs> So I owe you that. Um, R.J. Reynolds, my grandfather, founded the tobacco company in 1875. And he didn't know the dangers of smoking. He introduced camels in 1913. And he was worried that the paper might cause cancer. So he you know, expressed those sentiments to his brother. And his brothers came to him a few weeks later and said, don't worry, R.J., the, the paper does not cause cancer. We ran tests in Baltimore and in St. Louis. And R.J. said, I'm so glad. Roll them out. <laughs> now, that whole story could have been concocted by uh, a, a flack, a public relations flack for the company. So we'll never know if it's really true. But he did briefly delay the introduction of camels. He was a very colorful guy uh, prior to you know, introducing camels which was launched, by the way, with the first advertising campaign, a uh, national ad campaign of any product in America. They took out full-page ads in multiple ma major city newspapers all over the country. And the ad said three words, camels are coming. The next day, tomorrow in your town, there's going to be more camels than in all of Saudi Arabia and Egypt combined. And people said camels. And they were visioning camels and herds of camels marching through their cities. And the next day it said, today you can buy camel cigarettes at your local tobacconist. Well, and my grandmother wrote the slogan on the back, don't look for premiums or coupons as the cost of the tobacco is blended in camels, prohibits the use of them. And my grandfather, uh, she was a worker in the factory. And, and when he read that, he said, she wins. And I guess she was pretty. And he said, I'm going to marry her. <laughs> so that was RJ's wife. He married late. And that really, I think, more than any other single factor uh, caused the downfall of my family. I wrote a book about the Reynolds family called The Gilded Leaf. And I wrote it with a great writer uh, who's now very critically acclaimed, Tom Shackman, wonderful biographer. And we traced the course of the rise of the family over three generations and its decline. Um, and I think that the decline was precipitated by my grandfather's obsession with his rise, his meteoric rise as a carpet, you know, a robber baron of the turn of the century, 1900, coming up uh, in industry. And with his rise, he became so self-absorbed and caught up with his business and his importance in the community and so on that he forgot to get married until middle age. So. 
R.J. marries in, at age 52 or 53, and his first child is born when he's 55. He dies when my, my father was only 12 years old, when his father, the patriarch, died. Now you've got two kinds of rich people. You've got the, the rising business class, the declining old rich. Rising business class say to their kids, when you grow up, you're going to have to go to work and get a job. We're not supporting you anymore, so you better figure out how to go to work. Because you're not getting inherited money. We may leave it all to a foundation, like what Warren Buffett did. Of course, his kids each got a billion dollar foundation, and with that comes a six-figure salary, and we didn't mention that part. But uh, he didn't entirely abandon his children, but he did want them to work, which is smart. Unfortunately, RJ didn't put any stipulations much like that in his will, and I think my dad would get a dollar for every dollar he earned on his own, but, you know, so he bought a tramp freighter and converted into a, a, a little, you know, a luxurious yacht, and he would haul tobacco around the corn of Africa. And when he was chained to a tree, recovering from the delirium tremens, because he liked to drink, it was the 1920s and he was in his teens. Um, my father uh, uh, got the news that his brother had been shot through the head, and you know the Reynolds family is full of colorful stories like that. Uh, the younger brother was married to a big star, Libby Holman, and there was a big uh, tabloid scandal uh, whether Libby Holman had murdered her young husband, her younger husband, for the money. And of course she didn't. He probably shot himself. We'll never know, because it was never solved. But that's the kind of you know tale or two that I will impart to you uh, as a bit of color from my family. I think that, you know, when it, when it, RJ's absence caused, I think, my father to, you know, not pay a lot of attention to his kids. And so that began a chain of fatherlessness. And my father uh, was married four times. Let's see if I can get that to, there he is, a little before World War II. Uh, my mother was the second wife uh, he showered her with chains of rubies and emeralds, and she thought they went well with her red hair. And my dad, of course, became a playboy in the 1920s, uh, loving to fly airplanes, and he had a pilot's license signed by Orville Wright. And, uh, uh, you know, later he would invest in airlines. Citizen Kane had a sled, Rosebud, my father had airplanes, so he would invest in airlines. And around 1958, was the largest stockholder in Delta Airlines. There I am in 48 on the right, two weeks old. We will move on from that. That's my older brother, Mike. And now we get into you know, some of the stories I'll tell at the school tomorrow. Because a good speaker, and many of you are speakers, you're going to get out there and, and engage the audience by the heart. And I like to engage the children by the heart when I talk about my father's absence in my life and his death from smoking. Now, my dad was divorced from my mom when I was three. There we are in the duplex of Beekman Place in New York City. This is one of the homes she got in the divorce. And they called me Sad Sack. I carried a lot of sadness around because, you know, where was my dad? And that was the root of it. I was a laughing boy, smiling a lot. But underneath that, there was a current of sadness and again, a little, a little bit sulky with the fire department of New York, Cadillac in front of my mother's home for uh, an event of some kind she was having, a charity, no doubt. So when I was nine, ooh, I wrote my dad a letter, and the letter said, Dear Dad, where are you? I want to meet you. And he was traveling, and the letter was forwarded seven times. And I'll ask the children tomorrow, how many of you do not have your biological father living at home with you? So quick show of hands, how many of you grew up without your biological dad living in the house with you? Anybody? Wow, so great. Families here stay together. I must be in the heartland. It's wonderful. But I've spoken in cities where I see a third of the hands go up. I see half of the children's hands go up. And I say, I don't know how you, I'll tell them tomorrow, I don't know how you feel about that. But today I want you to get in touch with what you're feeling. Know what you're feeling. Know your anger, your sadness, your joy, 
your love, your fear, your shame. I want you to know what you're feeling and above all be able to talk to another person about it. That's a recurring theme in my talk for the children, to connect with other people. Because people who succeed best, I will tell the children, connect with others. They get help. A businesswoman, a businessman gets a lawyer when, to write the contracts, a marketing person to do the marketing, an advertising person to do the advertising, a marriage counselor when their marriage isn't what it could be, a doctor when they're sick, and so on, an accountant to do the accounting, whatever. So when you connect with other people, you succeed better in life. And that's a core theme that comes up three times in my talk for the children. Don't try and shoulder a problem alone, but connect with the trusted teacher, the school counselor, your friends, your parents. Anyway, my dad was not there, so I wrote him a letter he sent for me, and I'm on the plane going up to meet him on one of those big Delta jets, which had just come into service in 1958. And he was the biggest stockholder of the company at that time. And when they sh my mom brought me up to believe he was wonderful. And when they showed me into the room where he was, I found him there lying down on his back. I said, Dad, what's wrong? I have asthma, son. Will anything to do with your smoking? I asked. <laughs> no, I don't think so, smoking like this. There's R.J. Reynolds dying from the product that made him rich, powerful, famous. And I only got to see him five times after that. Every time I saw my father, he was increasingly sick, frail, counting the time that he had left to live. So that had a great deal to do with why I would later choose to turn my back on my family's company and fortune and walk away. And to do everything in my power to connect with young people, especially to prevent them from getting addicted in the first place, to empower smokers to quit successfully. That's why I founded the Foundation for a Smoke-Free America in Los Angeles, where I live. And I'll do this work the rest of my life. And I'm committed to it. Uh, it's not just because of my father's death. I also get to make a difference doing this work. Being a Reynolds, I discovered, gave me a platform to shine the spotlight of public attention on whatever tobacco issues a community might be facing. So I have um, first spoke out publicly in Congress in 1986. And my testimony in Congress, when I actually agreed to speak out publicly, uh, having been invited, somebody heard I was anti-smoking was carried on all the major news media, and I was catapulted into the national spotlight. And I was besieged with requests for speaking engagements and TV interviews and all that. And uh, I began answering the call. Smoking bans were partial at that time. We're having a no smoking area in our town, and you're going to have a no smoking area. And some people said, are you kidding? We've always had smoking. Don't change. But we were going to have a no smoking section. There was resistance to that. And some people just didn't want to change. They just weren't going to be progressive in any way. And now we look back and we say, Jesus, do they ever allow smoking in restaurants? You know, in a lot of states now. But I began to work on campaigns like that, uh, state cigarette tax hikes, uh, many different policy issues. I was able to you know, work you know, stump for ballot measures in various communities. And I answered the call and got more and more involved. As I began to get more involved in the movement, I became noticing that there was one particular thing. Uh-oh. That was both the slide order got reversed. But that was me going up on the plane. And then I got to meet that guy. I was wondering where that slide was. OK. And um, <coughs> I got more committed to the cause. And I noticed one thing that kept coming back. But before I get into what that was, I will show you a video uh, of a public service announcement that we did for the Truth Campaign. This particular one won a Clio. Do you know what's in cigarettes? No. Because the last thing the tobacco companies want is for you to know how many poisonous chemicals there are in cigarettes. So they just don't tell you. Not in the pack, not in their ads. 
I'm Patrick Reynolds, the grandson of R.J. Reynolds. My family's name is printed on the side of seven billion packs of cigarettes every year. Why am I telling you this? Because I want my family to be on the right side for a change. You know, folks, they say that you find within your deepest wound, where you have been hurt the most deeply, your calling. Sometimes that's where you find your gold, what you're supposed to do with your life. It's the ex-alcoholic who becomes a good speaker on alcohol, the ex-drug addict who becomes a good speaker on drugs. And within my deepest wound, not having my dad in my life. And in that wound, I found what I was supposed to do. Now, as I worked on the political campaigns to raise state cigarette taxes or uh, stump for a smoking ban, whether partial or 100% over the years, I began to notice you know, more and more about the opposition. And I began to have a central theme, something that I kept seeing over and over in state after state. And it was the influence of the tobacco company's money. I don't know where we are in the show. So maybe a little help to get to the next slide. Uh, the tobacco company's money. Oops, I'm looking for a shot of the, that's the one. Thanks. See, winners get help. <laughs> their money, their influence over our politicians and our elected officials. The campaign donations are obscenely huge. Philip Morris is one of the largest campaign donors in the country, if not the largest. And it so happens. Um, well, we'll talk a little bit about this briefly, but I think I have to say this. I hesitate, but it needs to be said without being political, but simply educational, that 80% of Big Tobacco's donations have gone to Republican candidates and PACs, and that in the Bush years, we could not get FDA regulation of tobacco. We could not get a 61 cent federal cigarette tax hike from Congress. Even though that tax hike would bring in revenue, it would stop children from starting to smoke, it would give smokers a strong financial incentive to quit, and with less smoking, of course, what do we save on health care? It's in the billions. Billions with a B. We couldn't get it done under Bush. Now, the Democrats have their own bugaboos. You know, the trial lawyers, of course, are way too influential over them and so on. So both of the parties need to stop taking political campaign donations. We need campaign finance reform. One of my favorite politicians in Washington is John McCain. Because McCain went against the majority of his party when he advocated a strong tobacco settlement of those lawsuits by the states. McCain's a good guy, and there are some bad Democrats. But he went against the majority of his party. And we also saw. Um, You know, within, take, within two weeks of taking office, President Obama passed a 61 cent, and the Democratic Congress gave us a 61 cent federal cigarette tax hike within two weeks. Uh, and by June, we had FDA regulation of tobacco. No president in history has done more to come down on the tobacco industry than the Obama administration. And it just has to be said out loud. Now, I want to say one more thing about it, and that's this. I try to understand, and what came to me was this. We live in a complex time. We live in a complex time with very complex problems. But we don't have time to examine those problems and look for solutions to these incredibly complex issues that we face. So we come up with simple solutions that are inappropriately simple. Taxes are bad. We don't need government in our lives. These kind of oversimplifications, I think, are very dangerous. Now, my friend Tom Shackman, with whom I wrote The Gilded Leaf, and he's now written 34 books, he published a book called The 40 Years' War. And it's interesting. He talks about in it The ongoing battle within the conservative party between the ideologues and the pragmatists. Now, the ideologues are the ones who are saying, you've got to stick by the rules, and these are the rules because that's what people understand. And no taxes are bad, and regulations are bad. 
And against them were the pragmatists. Now, when Nixon wanted to open China back in the day, the ideologues in the Nixon administrations clamored and they said, they're a communist country, we can't open China. Nixon was a pragmatist and he had the vision to open China. And whether that was good or bad, I'm not an expert. But I'm just pointing out that you cannot take a rule, an ideological rule, and have it work in every single situation. And tonight we will discuss tobacco taxes as one example of a really good tax. And so when we hear that you know, taxes are bad, it's just an, a gross oversimplification. Good government, in short, requires a little, you know, it requires fine tuning. And uh, the pragmatists understand that in either party. So we hopefully will have campaign finance reform one of these days. Let's talk about tobacco advertising. Uh, this is, these are images I'm gonna show the children tomorrow. They began adding not just candy flavorings like coconut and lime, as they did here, but referencing alcoholic beverages, clearly targeting kids. And I'm gonna ask the children tomorrow, as I ask you to open your hearts, I will say to them, open your hearts, know what you're feeling. Are you a little angry about this? Are you a little sad about it? Wow. And they won't hear anything about the ideologues and the pragmatists. They don't need to hear that. But I'm going to ask them how they feel. Oh, mint and toffee with a pretty girl in the ad. How do you feel about this kind of marketing? How about berry? Add some flavor to your party. They weren't going after, uh, they were not going after adults with these because they know that six out of ten smokers started smoking before the age of 14. Nine out of every ten smokers became addicted before reaching age 19. So I'll tell the children that and I'll point out that if they don't get you by 19, they are not going to get you as customers. They won't have you spending $1,500 to $2,000 a year to maintain your addiction to their deadly products. I'll talk to them then about how hard it is to quit. 95% of people without a program to quit go back to smoking within 12 months. And there I will re, re bring up that theme, people who succeed best get help. They connect with other people. With the best programs we have, nicotine replacement therapy, uh, 85% go back to smoking within 12 months. It is almost impossible to stop smoking once they get a teenager hooked. It is addictive beyond what I can explain in this talk. I will tell them that. So it's easier not to get hooked in the first place. And I wish Michigan was spending more money on tobacco prevention, but they're not because the states are broke. Most of the states aren't spending the money. They went after not just uh, African Americans because they know they smoke more cools, but they also, more menthol, I mean. So they went after African American women. I will ask the girls in the audience, how do you feel about that? Inviting and surprising, mocha taboo will entice you with its sweet indulgence. I mean, who wrote that? Deep and velvety, Midnight Berry surrounds you with the enchantment of the darkest night. I used to be an actor, I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> but those days are gone. But when I was very young, I got to star in one movie as a robot who was metal from the neck down, mm -hmm. and I was mandroid, and I had dialogue like, somebody says, hey man, do you need some body work? And I go, you're the one who needs body work. <laughs> <laughs> Eliminators. Do not rent it. It's only on VHS, so most of you can't, can't look at it. I don't tell the kids that because it's just better. You know, I think it's best forgotten. Okay, uh, that piece of advertising. That is the most egregious abuse of the First Amendment that I've ever seen. We've got a rapper and a DJ and a hip-hop artist on the cover. How do you feel about that? It is outrageous. And you know, I try to explain to the children that why is tobacco advertising even legal? 
They want to know. I say, well, one of the things I'm going to do today is we're going to revive an ancient tradition, I'll do this tomorrow, of initiation. They would take the children, the teenagers, in the forest or the desert, and they would initiate them into life, often by making them uncomfortable, introducing pain, depriving them of sleep, depriving them of food. I will not tell them that in traditional initiation, they would get a ritual wound or cut in most of the tribes on every continent around the world. They would get this ritual cut because there's too much tattooing and piercing going on. So we'll avoid that, but I just say that they put obstacles in their path, they introduce some kind of pain into the teens' lives, and I could never understand why they did this. And one day it hit me like a ton of bricks. I got it. It was as though the elders were trying to say to the kids, until today you've been a child. We adults have done our best to shield your eyes from the evil and the pain in this world. But today I want to gently, in a little pre-initiation for the middle schoolers, because they're growing up fast, to pre-initiation, to gently open the eyes and let them know that there are some bad people out there. There are tobacco industry marketing executives who do not care about your health. They're in the corporate machine if they don't serve the profit motive at R.J. Reynolds, which owns Cool now. They're fired. <laughs> the machine tosses them out. I miss the mom and pop business owners on Main Street, but the big box retailers have put them out of business because they market products cheaper and more efficiently. But mom and pops are gone. And it's sad. Well, part of the initiation is there are some bad people out there who don't care about you. And let's talk about why tobacco advertising is still legal and why it's legal. Because our founding fathers, who wrote the Constitution, the first thing they decided to change was the First Amendment. 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 First Amendment provided for freedom of speech. And freedom of speech means, I'll tell them, oh, if I can do this. It's all right. I'll be all right. <laughs> that I can get up on this chair and I can tell you that the sky is purple and the clouds are green. Free speech. I don't get to yell fire in here because it'd be a stampede and people would get hurt. But I have the right. You can breathe easy now. Uh, I have the right to express my opinion. If it happens to be untrue, then that's my right. However, the beauty of our free system, our market, is that the market will sweep Patrick Reynolds, and I'll explain this to them, the market will get rid of me. I will not get any more speaking jobs. I will not get to speak in front of any more kids if I lie to the children. So the market gets rid of me. That's the counterbalance to free speech. But there's an old law in the books giving corporations the same right to free speech as individuals. And that's why the tobacco ads are still protected by, this, uh, by the First Amendment. And I think that one day we may have justices in the courts who will see that corporate speech at $12.8 billion spent this year on tobacco promotions and marketing, $12.8 billion is a different form of speech than a guy who gets up on a chair and says, the sky is purple. So one day perhaps we'll see you know, a different interpretation of speech which allows us to do more about this kind of marketing. Yeah, but Congress has mandated that on the other side of the uh, package, the uh, health detriments have to be listed quite clearly. Yes, we're going to, we have labeling. Now that we have FDA regulation, we've got much stronger labeling yeah, so uh, on the packages. So that's the, that's the counterpoint. Oh, sure. But one country has even gone to tombstone advertising. Tombstone packaging. They can't put color graphics and pictures on the cigarettes anymore. And uh, they're, they're really, I think that's where we need to go. But here, it's an issue. They're still protected by free speech. I think we need to do more. Anyway, because, hey, kids, buy two packs of Cool, and you get a free stick radio. This is an actual marketing of Cool. Hey, Joe, you think two packs is enough? Maybe we ought to give the little guys three packs. You think they'll get hooked? Nah, we're giving them two. We're giving them a radio. Two packs is enough. They'll get hooked. Now, I don't know that that conversation took place but I will enact that for the children because I think it communicates clearly who they're buying their cigarettes from. They went after kids with cartoon camel, when RJ, and that's the real Joe Camel there. 
Now, I got a bunch of these. I'm going to show them at least five or ten of the actual Joe Camel ads because they're powerful. We haven't got time for that here. But there's the real Joe Camel, <laughs> and, and that's how it is. Now, let's talk, take, show these ads here. These are the kind of ads we're not seeing in Michigan anymore uh, that much because money isn't there anymore. We need to put it back. That hits home to a lot of children, and I, I love that one, because that's just U.S., 1,200 people a day here in this country, but around the world it's several times that, and the U.N. World Health Organization is telling us that around the world today, when you add up the higher rates of smoking in Europe and in Asia, that one out of three people, one out of three adults alive on the planet today are addicted to smoking. One out of every three adults living on the planet is addicted to tobacco. That's when you average all the countries where they have, like China. And 40% of them are gonna die from cigarettes. It means that we're gonna have uh, like 10 billion people dying from smoking in decades to come. And unless we just start to keep our kids from starting. Um, let's talk about, there it is, we're spending 12.8 billion uh, Michigan is spending a little under 400 million to counter advertising, so it's like a drop compared to what they're spending on advertising. Uh, excuse me, we're spending on advertising in Michigan. To big Tobacco is spending almost 400 million here. There's your state spending, so 400 million against 2.6 million at the state level, plus 4.5 million coming in from uh, federal funding here. 2.8 million from the uh, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which covers things like the 1-800-QUIT line. Um, and that's going to expire. And 1.6 million was a CDC grant that really expires this month. And I don't know if it was renewed, but it expired, was meant to expire in April of this year. So some of this federal money is going to go away, and we're going to be left with 2.6 million against 400 million in tobacco advertising here. We've got 1.3 billion in revenue coming in from tobacco. How interesting, wow. Well, we've got cigarette taxes coming in, plus lawsuit settlement payments. Remember the lawsuits by the states to recover the cost of Medicare and Medicaid caused by smoking. And they got a big multi-billion dollar settlement. So when you add that together with tobacco taxes, we're getting 1.3 billion a year in tobacco generated revenue, but only two tenths of 1% uh, is being spent on to teen smoking prevention. Because the states is not required to spend any of that money on our teens. They can, it just goes into the general fund. So the CDC recommends Michigan spend 121 million so we're spending only 2% of what the CDC recommends for a comprehensive, effective prevention campaign here. And it ranks Michigan 42nd out of 50 states in prevention spending. 
and they get an F in their report card in that category, prevention. Meanwhile, we've got 18, interestingly though, we are a point lower in high school smoking than the national average, so that's a good thing. I think it's because of the $2 state tax on tobacco. 15.3% of Michigan high school males use spit tobacco, a little over the national average, but I suspect it's more in rural areas, and close to 20% of all Michigan adults smoke. It's close to the national average. Uh, we've got a lot of kids exposed to secondhand smoke. Healthcare costs 3.4 billion. I'm gonna move through this. States that are spending less on prevention have a higher rate of teen smoking. There's just a clear correlation between the two. You have uh, 18,000 kids under 18 become new daily smokers every year here. Almost 300 kids, 300,000 kids now alive who will die from smoking. And this is significant. I put it in red because the use of smokeless tobacco and snooze and orbs all the smokeless products is now on the rise. And significant because you can't smoke in a lot of public places, so the tobacco company is now shifting their marketing to include smokeless tobacco products. And there's a whole controversy in our movement uh, between those who say that, well, it's less harmful, causes a lot less, doesn't cause lung cancer, causes a lot less disease, and they're right. Should we be tolerant? of these smokeless tobacco products. Well, if a person is using orbs during the day or snooze to get their fix of nicotine, and then they can go home at night and light up, which is what a lot of people are doing, I have a problem with it. And I think a lot of the people in my movement do too. So it's something to think about. I don't think that some of these products probably should not have been allowed to come to market, but they're out there now. Snooze is one of them. Uh, can you snooze while flirting? Again, they're not going after adults. Who flirts? It's young people. Of course, the answer is yes. There's a snoo that came out of Sweden initially, and uh, it delivers the nicotine. Supposedly, according to a 60 Minutes report, they don't find any mouth cancers yet, but I'm sure it's coming as the data comes in. It takes a while to get disease caused by tobacco. And I show that to the kids uh, as well, replacing the tobacco with the diseased mouth from mouth cancer. I'm gonna tell the kids that uh, some of their heroes were not so heroic. They were taking payments from US Tobacco, uh, now owned by RJR, RJ Reynolds. And this is an older picture, but they were on the field in those days with a wad of dip in their lips and I'll explain to them that, you know, a few years ago, not so long ago, chewing tobacco had almost disappeared. Only a few old men were chewing tobacco. It was gone. And some young fellow at UST, US Tobacco, said, how are we gonna get, our, get it popular again? Well, we'll pay baseball players endorsement fees. They'll have that round can of tobacco in their back pocket, and as they swagger across the field, with that round can outlined in their back pocket, everyone will know what that is. We will put countertop displays on every convenience store and grocery store, countertop by the cashier, right where they're easy for kids to steal. And don't worry, we'll replace any stolen products, Mr. Shopkeeper. <laughs> don't worry about stolen products, it's okay. We'll replace them. Just tell us how much you got stolen. <laughs> and of course, the children were getting addicted. And now we've got, in most states, the countertop displays behind the counter. And I'll ask the kids, how many of you know, let's take a poll among the adults, how many of you know that when you go in a convenience store that those countertop displays are paid advertising? The store gets money every month or a substantial discount on its tobacco products for keeping that display in the store. Does anybody know that? Not among the adults, imagine with the kids. They don't know, and I'll say to them, Year after year, you remember, where did, the, where did the tobacco products used to be? Next to the? Candy. Yeah, candy. Gee, who does candy appeal to, guys? And I say, you remember, I'll tell the middle school kids, you remember when you were that high and little, 
you probably, you know, mom may have gone in a convenience store and you saw those products next to the candy. At least the high school kids remember. But I, I tell you that there will be kids yelling out candy tomorrow. When I say they had the chewing tobacco next to the, and I listen, and the kids yell out candy. They remember because they were tiny. They were babies when those products were next to the candy. It was in our kids' faces. And I will ask the children how you feel about that. You didn't even know that the store was getting money every month to keep those displays in the store. And that's how they repopularized chewing tobacco with those countertop displays. They're not heroes. That's the reality. There's the reality right there. How about that? Gross out slide, got to show it. Before FDA regulation, after FDA regulation. I hope it makes a difference. I think we need to do more with their graphics, but First Amendment. OK, so not very many states. Only two of them are spending on prevention. Uh, 33 states provide funding at less than a quarter of what the CDC recommends for an effective comprehensive campaign. And three states, uh, Nevada, New Hampshire, Ohio, provide no funding at all. That's a betrayal of our kids because when we took those billions in the settlement of the tobacco industry lawsuits, it was expected they were going to do more to prevent kids from smoking. But the tobacco industry lawyers got a point in there that said all that money just goes directly into the state's general funds. They were very smart because the politicians uh, got at the money. Now, we've got, uh, so we're spending 2% on prevention nationally of what revenue comes in from tobacco on prevention. 25 to 1 ratio of marketing to prevention spending. Here's our grade and our report card. Uh, just for fun, we'll compare it quickly to Indiana's. You got a B, two F's, and a C. There's Indiana. Since we're in the Indiana Michigan border, it's the Michiana, of course. Smoke free air, they get three F's and a D. So you guys are doing better. Smoke free air B. The only reason that you don't get an A, you have a good strong smoking law here, the only reason you don't get an A is because you have something called preemption. That local communities are preempted, uh, th they can actually, I believe, preempt the statewide law. If they want to allow smoking, a city can pass that. So that's unusual, it's called preemption. Now, uh, we do have a good statewide law. If we can repeal preemption, uh, the Lung Association says that Michigan will get an A. So to about, we've talked about prevention spending. Cessation spending, we'll briefly look at it. The cigarette tax, $2, pretty good, but it's, uh, they still give it a C. Uh, there's our, I'm not gonna spend much time on the little points that are covered uh, for Medicaid and state, federal employ, state employees, but they have uh, still not got much benefit compared to other states. Cessation, again, there's not a lot going on. Uh, the quit line, 52 cents per smoker. Uh, CDC wants $10.53 on the quit line. 1-800-QUIT-NOW. That's the national quit line. That's you know, how we're not supporting that here uh, the way we should be. There's my sources. The report card is from the Lung Association every year in January, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. Uh, the tax, okay, so we have $2 here. Average state tax is $1.34, but they still give it a C because to get a B, you gotta have a state tax of 250 or higher. To get an A, you gotta do what New York did, uh, which for some people would be kind of scary. But the higher you raise the cigarette tax, the less kids you have smoking, the more you cut adult smoking, it is a good tax. Uh, let's talk about the tax. I'm not going to stay long on this slide, but we got a majority of voters uh, favored the tobacco tax. And let's, rather than spend time on all that gobbledygook, let's look at that. There's the poll. Uh, they positioned in the poll questions about how to raise revenue for the state. How are we going to raise revenue? 
well, we know we need revenue. Everybody agrees on that. So they said, would you like to cut education funding? <laughs> no, they said by what, 70%, uh, 80%. They didn't like it. Would you like to increase the state sales tax? Are you kidding? 72% said, all right, just so stop it. You know, we're already taxed to death. And they're right. Would you like to uh, reduce road funding? Or uh, how about raising the state income tax? Where's that one? Uh, increase the state income tax. Uh, wait, where is it? There it is. Increase the state income tax. Almost 80% said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> and the only way of bringing in revenue that was acceptable to two thirds of voters was raising the state tobacco tax by, it didn't matter if it was 50 cents, didn't matter if it was a dollar, it was uh, no difference in support uh, between a dollar and 50 cents across party lines, across demographic lines, across all income levels, the results were the same. We need to have our legislators take a look at this poll because it's a win for politicians, voters like it. When you put it in the context of other means of raising revenue. Uh, Republicans and Democrats equally. Clear majorities at every income level. Uh, even 44% of smokers said, let's raise the tax. Can you imagine? Because they thought maybe it's going to help me quit. Huh? And they're right, it would It'd be a strong incentive, big motivator. We had our uh, 61 cent tax. I've sort of talked about that. I'm going to skip over this stuff. Brings in a lot of revenue, gets kids to not s less packs a year sold, almost 9% less kids smoking. Kids alive today who will not become smokers, a million eight. And that's, with the, just with the, that's without spending on education. The tobacco tax has almost the same effect as spending on education. I don't think we should shortchange our kids in education, but in a pragmatic time, when we have to tighten our belt, maybe this tax idea ain't so bad. So you got to think outside the box. Not all taxes are bad. We live in a complex time with complex problems. I know what you've done. And I know what you're doing. You sell a product that contains addictive chemicals. So your customers stand little or no chance of ever being able to stop using it. Slowly, over time, it kills one third of them. To replace those dead customers, you try to market your product to kids as young as 13. The fact is, you get 89% of your new business it's from teens. I've seen the proof. It's in your own words, on your own letterhead. Stamp, top secret. You screwed up when you tried to hide the documents. And now they're on the web. They're on the web. I lost my grandfather. My grandmother was manipulated by your lies for years. My grandfather died because of your product. Was the money you made worth it? You've gotten rich selling a product that kills over 1,200 people a day. Every day. So while you're lounging around your comfortable house, watching this message, look into my eyes. I know what you did. And I know what you're doing. And that's, that's why, why I got, got involved. involved. And I won't stop until everyone else knows what you're doing, too. Yeah! Oh, yeah! I'm going to show that tomorrow at that middle school. And they're going to start a SWAT group if they don't have one. You run these on uh, commercial television? I'm sorry? You're running these ads on... I'm not running a thing. I don't have any money. What do you um, mean? Does, uh, anyone, yeah. does anyone funding these on... Funding? This is not being funded. This is the kind of money that we used to see. This is the kind of thing we used to see on TV. And now it's gone the way of you know, all many good ideas. We could fund it. We could take some of that huge revenue from tobacco and get these ads back on TV. We owe it to our kids. Those ads were so powerful. Just put that on a Saturday morning cartoon show. I don't care. How, how hard would that be? How expensive would that be? And it's a powerful testimony by those kids. No one has more influence over them than each other. I can stand up there and tell you don't smoke, but we know from Pavlov that kids are like little laboratory scientists, and they're going to go experiment. I'm going to beg them not to do it tomorrow. I'll talk briefly about a smoke-free workplace. We've got a good smoking law here. All we need to do is repeal preemption. Michigan gets an A. 
But we have now, I don't think we need to belabor the dangers of secondhand smoke. Does anybody not think secondhand smoke is dangerous? Anybody not think it causes lung cancer or heart disease in non-smokers? We don't have to spend time on this. We get a B, as I mentioned. Uh, the overview of the law, I'm sorry, but it's a lot of minute and it's pretty well prohibited everywhere. I see, oh, in bad states, you see restricted. It means smoking areas are allowed. But here we get prohibited almost everywhere. This is the only thing. Preemption, if preemption were repealed, Michigan's grade would be an A. It means that local communities, I believe, can go against this law. Will we ever be able to what? To stop smoking in the casinos and gaming, gaming and stuff. That's the Indian nation. And Native Americans have their own nation, so I don't know. It's kind of like the freedom of speech thing. And, and I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> but I uh, know that uh, gambling attracts compulsive people, so does smoking. So they kind of go hand in glove. And to get them out of the, the let's finish my talk, and then I'll We'll have a little dialogue, hopefully. Um, less heart attacks when you get rid of secondhand smoke. The Institute of Medicine is extremely prestigious. Uh, Italy has claimed that there was hospital admissions fell by 11% under people under 60 when they banned smoking across the entire nation. I hesitate to put that one in, but it was to point out that <laughs> smoking, sections, smoking sections do not work. Okay. They made me take it out in Texas, but anyway. <laughs> All right, and I thought that's one place, that, you know, they're very earthy, it would have been okay. All right, so tipping point. Now here's what's key. 28 states have now banned smoking in all bars and all restaurants. 28 states. 27 of them did it in the last 10 years. Hello. California did it way back in the dark ages in 1993, but starting in 2001, the next state did it. So it's 10 years, we've had 28, 27 more states come on board. And I think that's very significant. Maybe it's nine years, whatever. Uh, four more states have covered restaurants and so on. Hospitals. Uh, Lakeland Healthcare is a smoke-free campus. Again, uh, the administration had true vision, showed great leadership in Michigan to ban smoking on the campus, and congratulations Lakeland Healthcare for doing that. We've got over half the population now with 100% restaurants and bars smoke-free. And lots of countries are now banning smoking as well. Um, I have to laugh because I spoke in Missouri two, a week ago or two weeks ago, and I did a find and replace. So all the MOs got changed to capital MO. Oh. <laughs> Marshall Islands. Okay, so I'm going to make some corrections. All right. That I'll show to the children. <laughs> and I'll ask them, use your critical thinking skills. What is that a picture of? Oh, it's a picture. I mean, how many times have I heard this? A bunch of people outside smoking? Yeah, why are they outside? Well, they can't smoke inside? Well, why can't they smoke inside? Uh, because it's not allowed? Everybody heard of secondhand smoke? And of course, we talk about secondhand smoke. And I will act for them what they're going to look at, what they're going to be doing in a nightclub in a few years. Uh, hey, guys, I've got to go outside. You mind? Well, where's Joe going? <laughs> Man, he has to go outside to take a cigarette. Oh, no, he smokes. Why would you take up a product that all but guarantees you social rejection? Contrary to the Marlboro men, I'll show them lots of images of the Marlboro men gathered around a campfire in friendship, Joe's place, smoking camels, cartoon camels, smoking cigarettes in a bar. I've got all those slides to show them tomorrow. It was a lie. You have to go outside. And you are not welcome in the friendship circle when you smoke. Just reality. And there's the real Marlboro country. I'll point out to them that this I don't like because we're calling someone a fool. And I will there teach them a formula for saying no. How do you say no? If you call me a fool, I'm certainly not going to listen to you. I will tune out. I'll walk away. I'm out of here. Goodbye. If you want to just connect, I'll tell them. 
Talk from your heart. Tell them what you are feeling. Start with an honest compliment. I'll have volunteers come up from the audience. It's fun. Do they give a lot of compliments in your family? No. Well, that's a fine family language. Let's learn a language. I speak French and some German and some Spanish. Let's learn a language where they give praise. Nothing wrong with a family that doesn't give a lot of praise. They raise excellent kids a lot of the time. But let's learn a different family language. How about who wants to be mom? Mom, mom's here. She comes up. You want to ask mom to quit smoking? Start with a compliment. Well, <laughs> I like your hairdo. <laughs> yeah, how'd that feel, mom? Well, that felt okay. Do not say but. You say, I like your hairdo, but you gave with one hand and you took it right back with that other hand. Use and. Core of the lesson I will teach them, I feel. What do you feel when you see your mother smoking, I will ask her. Well, you've got six primary colors of your hearts. You have anger, you have sadness, you have joy, you have love, you have fear, and you have shame. What do you feel when you see your mother smoking? Now, a little anger? Yeah, I feel a little anger. It doesn't have to be a temper tantrum. Anger can be, Mom, I feel a little angry that you're smoking in the house. I'll find out from the kids how many of their parents smoke, and then how many of those families, how many kids have families where the smoker goes outside whenever they smoke. They don't ever smoke in the house. Hands go up. How many kids, mom or dad, smoke in the house whenever they feel like it? Hands go up. I say, you guys, your first group, put your hands back up. Look around and see how many families there are where they don't smoke in the house ever. So anyway, I feel a little angry, any sadness, yeah, any shame. Sometimes they feel shame. Teenagers, shame. They're ashamed that dad smokes and be seen in public with them. Tell them, I feel afraid. Afraid for your health or hers? Oh, hers, I want her to quit. Well, it could hurt you too. I teach them not to nag their parents to smoke, to quit smoking, because if you ask more than three times a year, you're a nag. But you get to be a pest every day about second and smoke in the house. So compliment and, not but, I feel and anger, sadness, joy, what do you got? And your boundary, your limit, the border you put between yourself and another person, I want you to quit, mom. I want you to smoke outside. And compliment, I love you. And that time you took me to Disneyland makes my heart go pitter-pat when I think about it. Dad, the time you spend with me means the world to me. And I love you so much. And I need you here. And then shut up for three or four months until you get to ask him again. You get three times a year, otherwise you are a yucky, obnoxious nag. What can parents do with kids? Here's my advice. I learned all these things from my old therapist. You know, I was going through a divorce in 85 and got in therapy and and I, when I speak at colleges, I say to the kids, if you haven't been in therapy and taken inventory of how your parents treated you when you were a child, I regard you, frankly, as poorly educated. If you haven't been in therapy and had a few sessions to talk about your mom and dad in your childhood, you're not fully educated. Go get that technology. Get that clarity that comes out of it. And I urge kids to see the school counselor just as a matter of course. Reach out. Touch someone, connect, solve problems together, not alone. If you're carrying around a deep, dark secret, you never told anybody, it's like carrying around a 500 pound weight. Set it down, talk to a trusted teacher, the school counselor, your friends, your parents. They're going to get a powerful talk tomorrow that will serve them their whole lives. But if you call me a fool, instead of talking from your heart, I'm not going to listen to you. And there's Joe Camel with his friends gone alone, in pain, dying from the product that killed him. And he might be saying, I'm sorry, I smoked. I'm going to die. We are leaving our time now. We are going back in time to a time before this time to Oklahoma in the 1970s, to a small town. 
Thousands of years ago, they had no books, they had movies, they had no movies, they had no TV. They told stories around a campfire, an oral tradition. We come in on a boy named Sean Marcy. He was an attractive young fella, loved having his hair neatly combed, hated when he got a pimple. One day he took his little sister skating on the ice, and the ice was thin, he fell through the ice, she fell through the ice, and he ran, and he got her a rope, and he, he called, he threw her that rope, and he hauled her to safety, and he saved her life. He discovered that day that he could run like the wind. Whenever you volunteer for a nonprofit or do something nice to someone else, you're gonna get back 10 times what you gave without any idea that something nice could ever come of that. You never thought of any self-gain. He discovered he could run that day. Someone said you should join the track team. Join the track team. Pretty soon he won a medal. Then he won another medal. Got his picture in the paper. Well, later on, he won another medal. He would win 27 medals in all in track competitions. And he got another picture in the paper, and people in the town said, that's Sean Marcy. Look at Sean Marcy. And pretty soon they were saying, that's our Sean Marcy. One day, Sean comes home, and he has a bulge in his lip. And his mother was a registered nurse, and she looked at him, and she said, what's that, son? Well, I've been dipping, Mama. You've been dipping. Don't you know that those little white sores you get are precancerous lesions? And I like to think that she did what I wish parents can do. Here is what parents can do. Every time your child does something responsible, praise them for it. Use the word responsible. Honey, you cleaned up your room. You are such a responsible young lady. Son, you got a B in school. You're such a responsible young man. And the child soaks it up like a sponge. I am responsible. Because you're their parent. After all, you must be right. You put dinner on the table. You program your children to be responsible when you praise them for being responsible. Do not give it all to the oldest one. Because the oldest one usually gets most of it. Next one down thinks, well, he must be the smart one. I'm the stupid one. And the little one, younger one, is the cutie pie. I need the cutie pie. No. <laughs> I was the young one. But to be a man, I learned that you had to give that up. And anyway, so your parent, you can, and then later when the kids get older, you can say to them, honey, you know, with, rather than I'm so worried about you going with boys, I'm so worried about your smoking, I'm so worried about your drug use, you can say to them, you know, I'm not worried because I know how responsible you are. And the child buys it. And you don't have to worry about them. But a parent who shows worry sends a negative message that there's something to worry about. The kid thinks mom must be right, and that's what we can do. So I like to think she said, you know, son, you've always been a responsible boy. You made up your run. You got decent grades in school. And it, I'm not going to worry about you. I'm sure you're going to quit this dip tobacco. And pretty soon he came home and he said to his mama, Mama, I'm going to quit. She said, I knew you would. Came home a few weeks later, Mama, I tried to quit. I couldn't quit. I'll try again, son. It's normal to fail a few times. You can do it. Try again. He tried again. He failed. He failed and failed and failed and failed. And he could not stop. Well. I'll tell the children, over here in life, you are a child. Over there, you're an adult making all your own decisions. Over here, mom and dad are pretty much making the decisions. And in the teen years, we start to cross this bridge. Be home at 8 o'clock, son. OK, mom, I'll be home at 8. Be home at 8 o'clock, son. Uh, mom, I'll see you at 9.30. Be home at 8 o'clock, son. See you Tuesday. <laughs> and they laugh, too. The kids laugh at that because it's so, and in that bridge, we start saying no to our parents. We have to find a way to tear ourselves away and become independently functioning adults, spreading our wings and flying on our own. And we got to say no to mom. And whatever you do, don't start with cigarettes or with drugs 
which will destroy your life and we'll cover that. Wear baggy clothes. Dye a lock of your hair purple, but do not start with tobacco, drugs, or alcohol. Take some time to get the disease tobacco causes for most people. In alcohol, you can die in one night in a car wreck. How do you get a friend to slow down when they're driving fast? Don't tell them they're a bad driver. Slow down. That's not, that doesn't work. Talk from your heart. Be vulnerable. I'm frightened when you drive like that. Oh, you're frightened? OK, I'll slow down. No problem. Talk from the heart. Connect from the heart. And you're heard. Those of you who are speakers, communicators, talk from your passion and from your feelings, and you will connect and be understood and persuasive. Sean came home, went to the doctor. A few days later, he's lounging around the house. Uh, the doctor had run some tests. And he's kicking back like he always did on a Saturday. Maybe he did his homework, maybe not. And he heard the phone ring, and he heard his mother pick up the phone in her room like she always did. And pretty soon, he heard what he thought was a sob from his mother's door. And he opened the door. There she was, sitting on the bed, looking out the window with her back to him, <laughs> crying. And he went up to her, and he said, Mama, what's wrong? And she turned, and the tears were coming down her face. And she looked up, and she said, son, you have cancer in your tongue. We've got to go to the doctor. They went to the doctor. The doctor said, I'm sorry, boy. And the middle school kids will hear this message tomorrow. But we are going to have to amputate. Cut out your tongue. Cut out my tongue. Cut out my tongue. Will I be able to talk again? I don't think you're going to be able to talk like you are now, son. Anger. Can I still run in the track meet on Friday? Yes, son. You can run in the track meet on Friday, but after that, I'm going to need you in here. And he ran in the track meet on Friday, and I don't know if he won or he lost, but he did his best, which is what sport is. And after that, he went in, and they cut out his tongue. People from the town sent cookies and cakes. And he couldn't have any. He had a feeding tube going up his nose to put liquid food into his stomach. This is after the second operation. Mama, I'll get better, he claimed. He was the man of the house. No father in the house. I'm going to get better. You'll see, he wrote. Couldn't talk. Cancer came back. He had to go back, have part of his jaw removed, part of his nose removed, part of his neck removed. And his best friend came down from Chicago for what would be their last visit and said to him, after sitting in silence on Sean's bedside for a spell, got an idea, said, what if we got a photographer? And before he could say the word photographer, Sean made a noise. Ah, ah, and he, he wrote, no, no. I don't want anybody to see me this way. I feel so ashamed. Just get out. Leave me alone. But what if other kids could see what tobacco can do? Maybe they wouldn't start this dip tobacco. And he thought about it. Very reluctantly, he looked up. Never cried. He wrote, OK, bring the photographer. And he probably said, but I don't want to be remembered as some kid who got cancer. Let's get the track medals I won and put them on my chest. And they could see that I was Sean Marcy. And he let this picture be taken as a gift for each and every one of our kids. And I've shown it to easy 100,000 kids. His friend said, do you have some message for the young ones? What would it be? And he thought about it long and hard and finally looked back, held back a tear. And he wrote, here's my message for the other teens. Don't dip snuff. And he expressed a simple affirmation of his Christian faith. And not long after that, at the age of 19, Surrounded by friends and family, the boy died. So take a look. We will remember you, Sean. We will learn from your tragic short life. And we will not make the same mistake of dip tobacco. I'm going to close my talk with you and with the children tomorrow. Uh, I am just concerned that this big rise in smoking that we saw among our kids from 78, the year Joe Campbell was introduced, 
excuse me, from 88, the year the cartoon camel came, until 98, we saw a 73% hike in teen smoking. Why? The CDC said it's the ad campaigns, Joe Camel, the Marlboro Man, uh, smoking in movies. I'll do a big section of my talk tomorrow about smoking in movies and how the movie stars who smoke betray them. But I believe there was a third factor, which has not been researched, and it should be. My foundation would like to research it. How does kids' attitudes about the future affect their use of drugs and tobacco? And, you know, I started, I came across some data in the early 90s that said that kids were not believing in the future, they had a keen sense of diminished expectations. Well, imagine after 911 how they feel now. So I will say to them tomorrow, yes, we live in a time of reports of global warming in the news and new diseases like SARS and bird flu and AIDS and swine flu. We have uh, the threat of a terrorist attack at home and wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and the collapse of the stock market. And is there going to be a job there for me and uh, a tsunami in Japan and the breakdown of a nuclear reactor? Whoa, it's a scary time. And I want to reassure those children who are worried about the future that it is looking incredible. We will get through all those problems. We'll find cures for the diseases, ways to prevent them. We already have. We will have world peace one day. We will have a society free of tobacco and drugs. And we will get through every single problem together. And I walk them through four points, talk about it, won't do it now. Think positive, talk about it to another person, a trusted teacher, the school counselor, your friends, your parents, and reevaluate what real wealth is. You're R.J. Reynolds' grandson, you're rich. Well, I'm not rich in terms of money, but I am rich in terms of what's real wealth. Having a son at home, a wife who loves me, good friends. That's real wealth. And it's not just about money. As China and India industrialize, we cannot sustain the planet all consuming resources the way we do. So we will all maybe have to reevaluate what wealth is and redefine it in years to come. And I don't have the answers there. But I know that we'll get through those problems together. And on the other side of any problems that come to us which we'll face and solve together. There are glorious times coming. I believe there are wondrous things coming in this world. And you will need your health. So don't smoke and don't use drugs and don't drink alcohol. Hold on to your health for those glorious, incredible times ahead of us all. And one day, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a smoke-free society. We will have a society free of tobacco where moms and dads are there for their kids longer. And that society is coming, children, because of you. You are the future. You're the people in this community who cared about this issue enough to come tonight. And it's coming, too, because of you. And for that, I commend you. Thank you very much. Who would like to ask a question, or if you have to go, I certainly understand that. Uh, okay, yes, can you stand and tell me your name and what Kathy group? Kathy Belief. Okay, wait a minute, we're gonna, we're gonna, <laughs> hello. <laughs> I just wondered, uh, is there a percentage of lung cancer patients that are, have lung cancer from not uh, smoking or snuff or any tobacco related products? I had a housekeeper, and she got lung cancer, and uh, I don't, and she died from it. And I think it was from the cleaning products, but perhaps I could refer that question to you. Did you understand that? Yeah, I did. Okay. Um, it's, understand oh. it. <laughs> uh, I don't, uh, the exact amount is a couple percentage points, I think, somewhere around there. Yeah. Yeah. Industrial 
exposure. Industrial exposure, yeah, work exposures. Though it's, and that's sort of amazing to me, the uh, many of the patients I see who will come in with lung disease, who've smoked two packs a day for 40 years, and tell me it's the plant they worked in. It really had nothing to do with the smoking. <laughs> who else has a question? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you were next. Yes, doctor. One second. Take the mic. Tell us who you are again, please. Okay. Ed Floyd, medical oncologist. Uh, what do you think of electric uh, cigarettes? And uh, it's, uh, I, I'm wondering who uh, markets it, but anyhow, uh, do you think it's better than uh, typical tobacco products and why? I happen to like it. Because guess what? It's personal. Every time I quit smoking myself, every time I quit smoking, I used a cigarette substitute. Now, if you've ever been a smoker, or if you know one, tell them to close their eyes and take a drag. And then keeping their eyes closed, exhale. Don't, can't see the smoke. It's nothing. It's like little hot, weird flavored air going through your mouth. And it, it, it's 80% of the pleasure of smoking is gone. So when you have the e-cigarette, the first few days of quitting, I happen to think it's a good thing. Sustained use? No, absolutely not. You want to switch from smoking to a con sustained use of the e-cigarette, that's like jumping out of the fifth floor instead of out of the tenth floor. We don't know how dangerous it is. It's going to take years to get the data and have the studies. So, but I think that for one week while you're going through withdrawal, or maybe two weeks, of quitting smoking and then stop and throw it in the trash or sell it on eBay and get rid of it. <laughs> but I like the e-cigarette myself. And I, I don't think it should be banned. And they won't, the FDA won't allow anybody to say that it's for quitting smoking, but it's kind of obvious. Nobody that doesn't smoke is going to buy an e-cigarette. They're expensive. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, wait, I need to have you. Uh, I'm going to go down camera. Okay. My name is David Burke. I really admire what you're doing um, for education. Are there still members of your family that are part of the tobacco companies and still promoting smoking? And if so, what are your family reunions like? <laughs> <laughs> I like you. I like you for that. Because, you know, I would think, what's this audience? If you're, gonna ask me, if you're not going to ask me tough questions, you know, then... You know, but that was good, and all the better journalists asked me that. And you know, I went to see my brothers to talk about the problems and of tobacco, and that I was thinking of speaking out publicly. Patrick, you'll be an embarrassment to the family. Patrick, I have another brother. Patrick, I have stock in the family, and it's going to go down. You're going to make my stock go down, boy. And I said, because my father's first wife had four boys. They grew up in North Carolina, and. Um, they were concerned. We had some pretty heated discussions. And in the years since I've been doing this, I've received numerous awards and honors, uh, have been, you know, brought honor to the Reynolds name. And the price of the stock, well, that just soared. So they were happy. And, uh, the, you know, things, we, we kind of, I think that some of them were either jealous or more concerned about the, the book I wrote about the family. They wanted it to tell more of the story of their mother. But Tom Shackman is a great biographer. And we put the barnacles on my mother, on their mother. There was less on their mother than on mine, you know, because I didn't want to alienate them. But the book is, you know, certainly a fair treatment, but they didn't like the book. So anyway, in short, later I got along with my family. Sadly, I'm the only one living now. Um, there were, one I had four brothers by the first wife, they're all dead. One died of lung cancer, uh, no, excuse me, heart disease caused by smoking, R.J. Reynolds, the third. Um, another brother, my brother Mike was a crack addict, got run over by a car. My, my brother, oh, it's so painful to talk about, but anyway, one committed suicide. There was no father in the house. Hello? There was no father in the house. There was no family. My mother was there, and, and luckily, uh, you know, I have the luck to get in therapy. I had the, uh, I was the youngest one. I saw what they were doing wrong. We had inherited money at a young age. So my family, well, there is not a lot of family now. My parents are both dead. 
My mom died, you know, I think smoking hastened her death in 1985. But, you know, I lived next door to my wife's parents, and I married a, you know, they're European, and we live uh, in, next to the airport in LA, and, you know, side by side houses. We have an 18 month old baby, it's my first child, a son. So that's my family. You know, and you find, you know, um, I mean, some, some people that have, you know, achieved a good deal had ne'er do well brothers. And, you know, I don't say that they're ne'er do well. I've, I've missed them. I wish I would have them back. I'd give anything to have them back. Yeah. So my family, well, it's a sad family, a lot of tragedy and pain. And uh, I'm trying to get an agent to get my book to HBO. <laughs> be a good series for the, you know. But um, anyway, who else? Uh, okay, a woman, yes? I just have Could, a question. I'm not even going to ask you to stand up. Can you tell me your name, though? Kathy. Hi. Um, at the beginning, when Cigarettes First stuck, came out, was there more, uh, was there less additives in those cigarettes than there are today? Oh, sure, there were less additives. Uh, and they put ammonia compounds in tobacco to boost the delivery of nicotine into the bloodstream. And they also looked for strains of tobacco with higher doses of nicotine to make their products more addictive. What they did is just, it's just, I don't wanna say pure evil, but it wasn't like a, the difference between a mom and a pop business owner is that the mom and pop cares about the community. They care about people that they're selling their products to. The, the huge corporations are a machine. Walmart sucks the money out of the community as soon as you spend it there. And that's the difference. And I'm not saying that Walmart's a bad thing because they make things so cheap. But I do miss the mom and pops and the, the links to the community that we used to have from our main street business owners. But the drugstores, there we have CVS. The, the bookstores, we have Barnes & Noble, they're in bankruptcy, ha, ha, ha. But, um, or is it borders? The point is, you know, things have changed. And who else? Yes, sir, can you tell me your name? Yeah, my name is Frank. Um, do you get involved in Europe at all? Because the Western European countries, uh, I think, on average, smoke more than uh, what you find over here. <laughs> even though they are more environmentally conscious mm -hmm. in all other areas, but when it comes to smoking, it's very bad. Svensk? No, German. German, ah, this is in Deutsch. Ich war heiratet mit einem Deutscher. Ich kann in Deutsch reden. Habe ich 30 Stunden in der Bernische gelernt? And anyway, yada yada, I can speak some German. Yeah. No, well, I met my first wife was German, so I had to learn German. Yeah. But, uh, and I spent time in Germany, and I, my father loved the Germans. His last wife was German. So I wanted to know. I, uh, I was invited to, I'm dying to work in foreign countries, dying to get funded to go to Europe. Because, I mean, in this country, I will get you know, local television news if they don't have to drive too far. <laughs> uh, I will get um, you know, local paper and newspaper coverage. But in a foreign country, when I was invited to Greece by the uh, Minister of Health in 2009, I got profiled in five national Greek newspapers, two national TV networks. I'll get big national news coverage in Greece. And for one day or two days, I can get an entire nation thinking about tobacco. So, and also I think it'll pay more than the speaking fees I earn in the United States. So, so that's how I support my group. I don't have a lot of money. I, I you know, support it through our speaking you know, work. And the, uh, but I know that the success we had in Greece led me to think, my God, what if I did this in China? I reach a billion people. So I'm looking for corporate sponsors that can help fund my foundation to get me uh, and you know, build an endowment so that I can go on doing this work the rest of my life. And ministries of health, we've got a list of all the health ministers of the world with emails uh, from the UN World Health Organization in Geneva. I've prepared a proposal. I'm just about to send it out around the world. And it has a great letter of t uh, reference, a beautiful testimonial letter from the, the health ministry in Greece saying it was great working with Patrick Reynolds. He's a pretty good speaker. Uh, he was, he, he, 
abided by the guidelines we set in media training for his media interviews. He was a team player, and he delivered a message um, you know, that, that we found very effective and powerful for our battle against tobacco in Greece. So I think that'll take me to, and I hope it's not just the Middle East, but I hope it's going to be around the world. Yeah, I'd like to take the message to other countries. And if I can have a meeting with the health minister in every country, with the press invited, uh, and you know they're politicians and they like to get their picture in the paper. So, you know, the um, I would talk to each health minister about raising the tobacco tax, about a stronger smoking ban from internet cafes where kids hang out. We did that in Greece, and talk to them about spending uh, tobacco prevention funding. I suggested to the Greek health ministry that they get a, a reel of television spots like the ones I showed tonight from the CDC in Washington, and, and they got that reel, and they started running them on TV in Greece. So I can actually, you know, leave that kind of thing, plant those kinds of ideas with health ministers when I meet with them. And I want to speak to children in every nation's capital, and maybe go on a five or ten city tour in China and you know, do the local news in, in every city. And that's where I'd like to go now, yes. You bet, because we need to take it internationally at this point. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah, one where are you going to be tomorrow? Huh? Where are you going to be tomorrow? Uh-oh, I would have to refer. Who knows where I'm going to be tomorrow? Lake Michigan oh, Megan, College. Megan, you're? Lake Michigan College. Lake Michigan uh, College. One second. Lake Michigan College. Lake Michigan College. Do you know where that is? And at 10 a.m., do we know what building? The Mendel Center. Oh, <laughs> The Mendel Center. Uh, 10 o'clock. Oh, please come. Please come at 10 o'clock to the Mendelssohn Center if you want to see what I do. It's fireworks for the kids. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for caring. Thank you.